present their global case study, please welcome Nazia Dubois. Hello, everyone. Um, is this working? Yeah, cool. These are always very high for me. <laughs> So um, hands up if any of you have heard of Harry's. I love New York. <laughs> Nowhere else in the world do I get that. Um, I won't ask you if any of you have heard of Rice Bowl because I'd be very surprised if anyone had. Um, Rice Bowl is a strategy agency that I set up a couple of years ago after about a decade and a half in advertising in the big agencies. And I wanted to set up a new way of working, which um, sort of works along the lines of the new power values that Eliza was just telling us about. Um, we're very collaborative, very transparent, and I work with a lot of very inspiring women. It's a, it's a new sort of model that I think Ferris and you, Rosie also talked about yesterday in terms of sort of collaborating much more in terms of sort of small hubs of planning capability around the world. Uh, we're also quite nomadic. Um, I uh, was born and raised across Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, and China, so I have a very generally globally, global perspective on brands, and my big thing is getting Western brands to be a lot more um, cognizant of the reality of global consumers, having grown up in countries where we always felt like we weren't really the intended audience for any of the advertising that we saw. So um, that's kind of the, the thing behind Rice Bowl, and, and one of the things that we always try and do is make sure that brands have a voice in global culture that actually tackles some of the sticky, messy conversations that people maybe are a little bit afraid of tackling, but we try and encourage them towards that because I believe that if you have a point of view on something that people care about, then they'll start caring about you too. So when Harry's first came to us, this was... Um, a while ago, how does this work? Yes, so this was a couple years ago uh, when Harry's first came to us and they basically sell razors. As you know, they make really good razors, but they didn't have a cultural point of view and that's what they were in the market for. So we were excited to get involved and, and help them out on that front and needed to sort of see how far their ambition would actually take them. So I uh, think back to late 2015, um, the good old days. <laughs> Just to put things in perspective, right? So uh, Me Too hasn't happened. Time's Up hasn't happened. Trump hasn't been elected. Um, uh, you're all feeling really nostalgic right now. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's a time when Obama's just passed the uh, Affordable Care Act um, across uh, all states um, in the US. Serena Williams was just named Time Sportswoman of the Year. Um, what else happened? Bruce Jenner came out as Caitlyn on the cover of Vanity Fair. So it's a time when essentially it felt like liberal values were safe, right? It felt like we were, we were good. <laughs> it was all fine. Um, but then this is when I started talking to Harry's and um, I, was excited because this is a brand that believed in a lot of these values that I also believed in, and I thought, this is great. Let's try and build a cultural point of view. Um, you've already got a really strong business. These guys had gone and raised a ton of money, and then with that money, they bought a factory, which is not something people do anymore. Startups these days try and be as capital-free as possible, but they were um, like fixed capital-free, and they really went down this very different route, which is to go and buy a 100-year-old factory in Germany. And these guys, Andy Katz Mayfield and, and Jeff Rader, are two of the nicest human beings I have ever come across. And I've worked with a whole bunch of startups, and I was kind of a little bit like, OK, it's going to be startup guys. you know. And then I met them, and they were adorable. They were so friendly and so nice. And I realized that they had the germ of a very special culture inside Harry's that they hadn't yet found a way to articulate. Before I play this video, um, Actually, this is a video that basically is their very first um, ad that they put out there to introduce the world to Harry's. So if anybody doesn't know the Harry's brand, this is a good spot to get to know the brand. And then we'll talk about what we did after this spot. So this was released um, about a year and a half ago now. So this is just for you to get to know the brand a little bit. Hopefully this works. In the early 1980s, a child was born. Two of them, actually. Their names were Jeff and Andy. And inside these young men is what would become something great. Time went by, Jeff and Andy grew up, and they developed facial hair. I grew my first mustache when I was 11, probably like 13. Why? And one day, while buying razors, something happened. 
and you got ripped off. Getting ripped off sucks. Why the razors cost so much? Like there's no real good reason. Actually, Jeff, there is a reason. One big razor company has relentlessly increased prices for decades, making insane profits at the expense of customers. So Jeff and Andy decided to start their own shaving company. Jeff and Andy's parents were proud. Did we conceive Andy to take on big razor in an epic battle where David versus Goliath? Oh, hell yes. Let's <laughs> be seriously. Because there's a big difference between good and bad razors. It's pretending to truly are taking like a knife to your face. <laughs> and we almost put a bolt in the idea like six months in because we're like, we just don't know if we can actually make the products. We left Jeff and Andy with only one way to maintain quality and keep prices down. We bought a factory. They bought a factory. But not just any factory. They bought a fine factory. They bought fine technique. A 95 year old German factory. It's pretty loud! There are over 600 German engineers, craftsmen, and production workers create millions of precision blades a year. And they thought we were completely crazy. They call us the American German Cowboys. Now I'm calling them traps. You're a good hugger, Mr. Becker. <laughs> With the purchase of Fine Technic, the American Internet Cowboys discovered a way to create lasers of exceptional quality without the questionable design of their competitors. We essentially want to do the exact opposite of what's out there. The less, but better. Theirs it looks like it was shot out of space. We want something that looks like it was made on Earth. And by taking less profit and selling directly to you over the internet, Harry's can offer an exceptional deal. At half the blade price, and with all those smart people, and that factory stuff, and those sharp razors, and the handsome handles, and a smooth narrator. Thanks. Big Razor got nervous. They threatened to sue our pants off. Big Razor threatened to sue their pants off. And that's kind of the whole point of this film. Jeff and Andy are two guys who put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you. Who need to shave, just like you. Who don't want to pay too much and like good design, like you. But don't take it from us. Take it from a few of our 2,700,009 clean shaving customers. I'm Josh. I'm Andy. And this is Harris. Move the shaving company as a fix in the shape. Harris. Cool. So um, I really love that spot because it's a really nice intro to the values of the company and you can already start feeling uh, some of our positioning thinking come through in that uh, spot. Uh, we hadn't fully landed on the positioning articulation when we um, released that spot, but um, it sort of grew over the next few months. So this gives you a sense of the, how the positioning grew into what it ended up being, uh, which is, I think, the, the point of this case study is to show you how a global brand positioning strategy is a very long-term thing and it grows and evolves and it becomes a different animal over time and so you can see the seeds of it in this but it starts to become a very different thing over the course of the last couple of years which is why I wanted to show this first. So I don't remember what's next, let's find out. Oh yes, yeah. so <laughs> Harry's was ready to make even bigger waves, but this time in culture, they came to us and they said, look, we uh, make great razors and everyone's talking about how innovative our business model is, but we need a point of view on culture. And I felt that their progressive values were a really interesting hook from which to, to, to start to hang something off of. So the first thing I did, being a planner, was to ask, okay, so who's your target? And they said, um, well, his name's Brian32. <laughs> <laughs> and as they, as they kept um, describing him to me, I realized that he was uh, white, male, educated, uh, straight, liberal, bicoastal, and essentially them. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to the guys, um, guys, th 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 this isn't, this isn't going to work. If you want to build a global brand, where you genuinely want to, you know, you have 3% against Gillette right now, you want to go much higher, right? And you want to talk to guys all over the world, all sorts of realities. You need to start thinking about them beyond Brian32, because he's holding you back. He's a lovely guy, but he's holding you back. <laughs> so I went and did a whole bunch of data scraping and oh, you know, all the planning stuff, and you know, I, I found a whole bunch of people who were using Harry's that Harry's didn't know were using Harry's. And I was like, look at all these guys who are using your brand. You don't know that you have this whole trans community who love your brand. You don't know that you have a black male community who love your brand. You don't even realize that you have all of this support and all these pockets of diversity in the male um, experience that you're not tapping into because you're thinking, we're selling to guys like me, Brian32. You know. 
and, and, and Matt and Richard, etc. So we're trying to change things. So, so I said, um, let's, let's take a deeper look at these guys' lives. And so we did. We said, okay, this is Spencer's story. What has he done? How has he used shaving to come to terms with his uh, status now as a trans man after having been born Stephanie? You know, this is Kwame's story. How has he developed in, and what are his, um, the, what are the parts of his story where Harry's has been important to him? And so we did this with all sorts of guys, right? And so we gave them a really big, rounded, rich sense of how much potential their target audience could have if they broadened their, their definition. So they were on board with that and they were like, yes, good. Let's broaden our definition to include all shades of the male experience. We're totally on board. So that was great. Then we went and did all the other plannerly things, like you know, um, spending time on the factory floor. Uh, that was fun. Sp speaking to hundreds of employees, uh, working out what kinds of things they believed in, because I believe that a great brand positioning strategy has to be built on values that people in the company already hold. It shouldn't come as something of a surprise to people in the company when you unveil it. They shouldn't be like, "Wow, really? We believe in that?" <laughs> it should be like, "No, absolutely. That's an articulation of who I am, and I'm really proud of this." So that's why we spent time, hundreds and hundreds of people we talked to, dug deep into the state of masculinity in the world generally as well, because that was the thing that I thought we needed to really understand if we wanted to talk to all guys everywhere. And this is when things get a little bit depressing. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. <laughs> what we realized was that men were struggling. Now, uh, bear in mind, this is um, still 2016, before there was a huge global conversation around um, how things were shaping up for men versus women, which I think is you know, now probably past its peak or hitting its peak. Um, what we found were, okay, and these are some numbers, um, sorry, but men were four times more likely to commit suicide than women. There are three or more young men who are going to commit suicide today in the US and every day from now on, which is shocking. Uh, men are, uh, we heard about opioids yesterday, men are twice as likely to be opioid addicted in this country. Men are, 93% of men are, 93% um, of incarcerations in this country are male. 40% um, of the guys who joined college this year are going to drop out by the end of the year. They are not going to make it past freshman year. 90% um, of domestic violence is perpetrated by men, and this is probably one of the saddest statistics, is that fewer than 50% of men who suffer from mental health issues and suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts uh, reach out for help, which is far, far lower than the statistic for women. And, and that's really scary. When you look at all of this together, it's a super depressing picture. I, give, I, I, I agree with you, and I, you know, I give you that. But that's partly because of the way we're raising our boys. And there's been a lot of conversation about this over the last couple of years. Most people in this room are very familiar with this whole topic and the conversation. But if you haven't seen this um, documentary, it's called The Mask You Live In. I would highly, highly recommend it. It's by uh, The Representation Project. I'm just going to play you a few seconds of the opening of it because I think it's just very powerful and it helps to set the scene a little bit. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't be disrespect. Be cool. And be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a cattle tail. Bros come before the hoes. Don't let you woman run your life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. So that's just the, the first few seconds of the trailer. I would highly recommend you watch the whole thing. It's an hour, which um, is hugely worth it. Basically what was happening is that generally male mental health was in decline globally. Um, there was a huge toxic environment going on um, in which male mental health had plummeted and people weren't really talking about it yet at that point. Um, and let's be honest, advertising hadn't helped over the decades. We had put out a whole bunch of messages that were fairly toxic, like, you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you what they were. We probably, some of us, have worked on some of these campaigns. And we know that these are stereotypes that were uh, built off of uh, very limited sets of information. So this is one of the things that I found really interesting is when I started to look at masculinity and femininity, and this is a, very similar to a lot of the stuff Eliza was just saying about uh, feminine values, what you realize when you put, um, uh, when, you, when you look at the kinds of values that have been depicted in the media, they're very much of the extremes, you know, hyper-masculine, hyper-sexualized, hyper-aggressive, but this is very much the extremity of behavior. So our role models have been the wrong ones for the longest time, right? I love this 
this bit of, of Calvin and Hobbes, where Hobbes goes, why, how come we play war and not peace? And Calvin goes, too few role models. And I, I just think, you know, if you're only ever going to show people aggression and war and hypersexuality, that's what they're going to, you know, model back at you and at their children. So um, this is, sorry, another very plannerly thing to do is to stick a graph in there. But I just, I love this piece of data so much, and I'm really rubbish at explaining it, so I've got an MIT professor explaining it. Here. If you gave 50,000 psychological tests to girls, it would fall out of a bell-shaped curve. If you gave the same 50,000 psychological tests to boys, it would fall out of a boy bell-shaped curve. If you superimpose them, they'd be 90% overlapping. You've got the shoulders that like, stick out on either side, and those are very often the traits that feed into our stereotype. So I find this fascinating because we've taken those shoulders and we've made whole worlds out of them, you know, in the media. We've said those are the shoulders that we should all aspire to, hyperfemininity and hypermasculinity. But the reality is that 90% of the world lives in, in the middle, in between, and we overlap and we're not binary and we're very much um, products of both masculine and feminine values coming together. There's a really good Dutch psychologist, social, psycho uh, social scientist called Gert Hofstede, who um, has passed away now, but who was very um, influential in um, talking about how masculinity and femininity as values were things that countries could be uh, measured against. And a lot of countries in which, you know, high power distance values rule are hypermasculine and et cetera, et cetera. So you know how that goes. The thing is that most human beings have both of those sets of values inside them. And yet we as media owners and message creators talk to them as, they, they, as though they don't. Uh, or we have done for many decades. That is now changing. Hurrah. So um, we have realized by this point that what we were talking about was essentially in the area of masculinity and the, you know, I put the, that in quotes because it's not a, a, a non-messy subject, right? <laughs> like masculinity is a messy, fairly political um, space uh, talking about, you know, how masculinity is created and crafted and the values that go into it. It's a kind of sticky thing to go into as a, a brand in America right now. So it wasn't an easy sell at all to say to Harry's guys, we need to go beyond shaving and razors and think about the reality of the masculine experience. Because there were detractors. Um, there was the fear that we might actually um, lose some of our customer base if we started talking about our progressive values and how we wanted to shift things. Uh, but in the end, um, those values won because there were more people in the company who genuinely believed in it and actually because the founders were super, super um, inspired by the thinking. So. What we decided was this brand needed to stand for, needed to model um, a, a new kind of masculinity that was all about being an amalgam of both masculine and feminine values and, you know, took into account the empathy and the humility and the vulnerability and the listening and the kindness that make a good man, that make the kind of man we need more of in the world and, and actually modeled that and said, this is great, this is great behavior, this is how we can do more of this. In, in the world, and, and if companies like Harry's who have money don't go out there promoting these messages, it, it's not going to change. Like all the nonprofit work in the world on its own isn't going to change the situation that we're in. And so that's why I was super passionate about using their whole marketing budget towards this as opposed to just a little mm -hmm. tiny bit. So I was like, let's just go all in and do this. So they were super keen and happy to go with it, but we still needed a phrase, right? So they came to me and they said, we need, you know, they wanted a positioning. I couldn't just go back and say, you should just stand for these things. I needed to come up with a thing that everyone could, could sort of rally around and get excited by as a phrase so that they could work off of it. And I thought, okay, so this set of values that we want to promote, how do we take that and link it really closely to Harry's own um, history and its own culture? Um, and the first thing I remembered was that Harry's, um, iconic razor, the Truman, is bright orange. I don't know if anybody in the room has used it. Uh, but this is their first razor and the one that they're super proud of. And everyone, in, um, apparently, American sales of orange are much higher than any other color. Um, in Britain, everyone likes blue because they're boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I like the orange. And I thought, this is actually, the orange is ideologically and philosophically an interesting color when you think about it. Because it's not pink and it's not blue. And that could give us something interesting to work off of. So here's what I wrote. I said, in a world bound by damaging and reductive pink and blue binaries, let's create a more progressive future, one that's bright, open, and Harry's orange. The future is orange. Now, I know a lot of people are laughing now. If you've lived in the UK, and especially if you were there around you know, early 2000, you will associate this phrase with terrible connectivity on probably a Nokia handset. Um, <laughs> 
but great ads, yes. So this hashtag, this sorry, not hashtag, this tagline was used by Orange, which was then bought by Wanadu in France, I think. Anyway, long story short, it was a telecoms tagline in Europe, like forever ago. But I figured no one in America has heard of this, right? Like. Not really. And I figured this really does encapsulate what the positioning was about. I wanted this to be you know, the thing that everyone in the company rallied around. So I said, this is the positioning statement. It's the future is orange. And at first, people don't understand what it is. As soon as you unpack the thinking behind it, they get super excited. And they're like, yes, hell yes, the future is orange. And we've always been there. We've been doing this forever from day one. And so everyone got super excited. It became shorthand for our progressive values, our pride in Harry's, and our um, unashamed activism for a better future. And the thing that I love is that the day after I um, um, presented the positioning, the day after I did the rollout to the whole company, I had a flood of emails from people saying lovely things like, I felt so fortunate to be there, and I really think this brand positioning will give a lot of people on the team a purpose much greater than just selling razors. And I think this just went all the way through the company, and people started to really galvanize all of their actions around thinking, OK, how do we model how to be this, this better version of masculinity? Um, and so that was very exciting, and then all of the creative stuff happened. Um, I know this makes it sound like something bad happened. Nothing bad happened. <laughs> it was all good from this point onwards. So um, we took the creative in a direction that essentially became very meaningful and became all about the ideology of progressive masculinity. Um, and, uh, you know, as opposed to regressive or toxic, etc. And uh, the very first thing was on, um, what was it? It was International Men's Day, which is a thing believe it or not. Um, and on International Men's Day, we put out this ad, and um, the guys were invited to speak at uh, the Makers Conference uh, about this ad alongside Hillary Clinton and Gloria Steinem, which they would never have thought in a million years, certainly not three years ago, um, was even a remote possibility. So this is the work that first went out. If 2017 has taught us anything, it's that we need to rethink what it means to be a man. Now more than ever, being a man demands introspection, humility, and, we believe, optimism. We have to question what has become normal, and know that to stay quiet is to be complicit. Because if we're ever going to get to a better tomorrow, we need to take a long, hard look at today, and at harmful, misguided stereotypes that got us here in the first place. And then we need to act and change together. So this wasn't a TV spot. It was just a point of view that uh, we unveiled at the Makers Conference. Like that would have not been a great TV spot. But it was a um, it was a print ad. It was a full page print ad in the New York Times. I don't know if any of you saw it or remember it. Um, but uh, I have it framed because I love it. Um, but it was also the first time that Harry's came out against um, the essentially saying like this administration doesn't stand for the values that we stand for and so that was quite scary and exciting a lot of people uh, rubbished us on social media and said um, you shouldn't be partisan uh, you're a razor company but Harry stuck to their guns and said no this is what we're gonna do this is what we've decided to do and we're gonna go all in and so the next thing they did was put together a content platform called Man Enough, working with Wayfarer Productions. And I should say Rice Bowl was the um, strategic partner throughout all of this creative work that I'm sharing with you, although the creative work was developed by lots of different creative agencies around the world. Um, so Wayfarer put together this beautiful uh, series of masculinity-themed dinner party type conversations where men explored really deep so if questions. So at the table and seen something and didn't say anything. Objectification, harassment, of course. As long as we individually are not hurting anyone, he's still a good guy, he's still a well-meaning guy, and the truth of the matter is we're not. So this is one of the latest episodes that came out actually um, earlier this year around how, how men are responding to the Me Too movement, how men are not the victims. Um, and then there was this whole um, seminar that we did with the Washington Post around the changing face of masculinity, asking what does it really be to be, mean to be a man and getting a lot of audience participation. There was uh, this activation we did around Pride this year. I don't know if anyone saw it, but Harry's released um, a whole bunch of new razors, each of which was unique because they all had these iridescent handles, so every single one of them was different. And we used Jonathan Van Ness, who everyone loves from Queer Eye, um, um, talking about how when people give him dislikes, it actually gives him power. Um, Every time someone hits me up and is like, I see myself in you, and you gave me permission 
seems to feel more comfortable about who I am, it, like, I could never work again and it would be fine. Hi, I'm Jonathan Van Ness, and I'm a hair flipping free spirit and proud. So we had a lot of people from the LGBTQ plus community who were genuinely uh, promoting um, this, this version of talking about their identity and, and we had all of these videos are online if anybody is actually interested in going and having a look. Then we launched in the UK and that kind of tonality wouldn't have worked in the UK but we did a slightly different thing where we took a very British sense of humor and talked about how no one really wanted to see macho men and abs anymore anyway. Um, I didn't so think he needed to see a macho man holding our razor. So, it's <laughs> so we just ran a lot of those things, like, you know, on the skippables, um, we ran a lot of stuff like that, and it was kind of like just uh, fun and, 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 and taking the piss out of the, you know, the big guys who had been talking about Superman forever. And then this is the thing I'm very proud of, uh, it's Project 84 that we did in the UK. Um, I don't know if you know about this, but 84 men die of suicide in the UK every single week. And Harry's sponsored this project, Working With Calm, which is the campaign against living miserably. And I think it's, it's worth looking at the video. I know I'm running out of time, but could I have another three minutes? No? OK. All right, so we can't look at this video. Sorry. That's what happens when, when we run over. <laughs> Seven years now since my son took his life. I'm here with my sisters because we lost our dad. I lost my brother to suicide. Sometimes until it's at your front door you don't think about it enough. We've got 84 statues in total. There's 72 up on the high tower and then 12 here. See it visually, I think it will stick in people's minds. 84 men per week. I would never have guessed at that figure. I think the message here is that whilst it looks quite disturbing, there's a positive message of hope in the work that Karma are doing and trying to prevent and suicide. It's got to be a good thing rather than just brush it under the carpet and say, oh, it's one of those things we don't like to talk about. So um, Harry's was very deliberate about not branding this initiative. Um, we just paid for it. And I think that's one of the really important ways in which brands need to start um, doing their activism is genuinely putting their money where their mouth is and doing the work as opposed to saying, look at us doing the work and look at how many awards we won for it. Um, so no one's heard of Project 84 being done by Harry's, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very proud that we did this. Also, because 34, there was a 34% year-on-year increase in um, young men who had suicidal thoughts reaching out for help. And that was amazing as a statistic. So, yeah. um, that was very cool. This was also very cool. We um, funded an academic study working with researchers at UCL, University College London, and we took it to the Houses of Parliament. And working with three local MPs, we got a new budget signed for men's mental health. Uh, with the data that we had collected that Harry's funded the research for. So that was very exciting. I had never been to the Houses of Parliament, so that was, and I walked past it all the time, so it was very cool uh, to be inside and actually presenting a paper. Um, and these are the smaller things that happened. And yesterday you talked about outcomes, not outputs. And this is the kind of outcome that people should be really proud of when their positioning has this sort of outcome, which is on Father's Day, Andy, one of the co-founders, wrote an op-ed saying, we're now offering a new parental leave policy, which is 16 weeks of equitable paid leave to every person on our team, no matter whether you're a man, a woman, transgender, birthing, or non-birthing. And I think that is pretty progressive for this country. I know that the parental leave policies are different here than they are in Europe. And this is the kind of action that I think this positioning has, has really been able to drive. It's also been able to drive a new supplier code of conduct, whereby we now say that, well, this is an, uh, this is an email from um, Andy, the co-founder, saying, to me, the biggest thing would be to come up with Harry's policy based on what we think is right and orange and not rely on government. Of course, suppliers can choose to do whatever they want, just not if they want to work with us. And I think that's really lovely, because when, when I wrote The Future is Orange, I had no idea that it would start to affect things all the way down to this level of granularity, where we're actually now saying, 
saying, I'm sorry, your code of conduct doesn't protect your employees from bigotry or discrimination in whatever market that you're in, so we're not going to work with you. And I think that's amazing. Those are the kinds of metrics that are very hard to measure as a planner, but if you can find those nuggets, they're, they're gold dust to prove that your strategies have had the outcomes. Um, we all obviously also love creative work, so um, there is some great creative work here that we put out last year that won a couple of lines, but I'm not going to have time to share it with you. It's, the film is called A Man Like You. If you want to look at it, it's online. I'm not going to play it for you now. It's about a boy and an alien, um, and a, boy, a young boy essentially teaching an alien what it is to be a man. Um, it's, it's, it's quite sweet. Um, have a look at it if you have the time. And I think the final thing to say is essentially when you have a great piece of thinking, even if you don't have the right words for it, even if it's kind of like clunky and it's got lots of strands to it, it, it can unlock so much creativity across so many different kinds of people that, you know, going with your gut really just, it, for us, it really worked with The Future is Orange. Um, and instead of being very sort of protective of our positioning the way you were always told to, we were always said, told, you know, you, your position has to be distinctive and ownable. Ownable is a word that, you know, it's very hard to wrap your head around. It's we, we've been very different about it. We've said, no, actually, we want this to be something that everybody owns, because if everybody doesn't own it, if it's not a part of a bigger conversation, it's not going to actually change anything. So after nipping away at Gillette's heels for a while, they actually took Harry's to court for a couple of things, and then they decided, you know what, actually, we think this masculinity, this new modern masculinity stuff is quite interesting. We're going to get into it, too. And so a couple of weeks ago, they just launched... Um, the best men work, I don't know if you guys have seen that, which now starts to look at masculinity in a more critical way. Axe has obviously done an about turn on a lot of the stuff that they used to do. And a lot of brands are getting into the space, which we're very, very excited about and proud of, and we know we want to promote. Um, and finally, this is literally, I promised my final slide, this is the head of the CX team at Harry's. She just showed up to work one day in this orange suit <laughs> with the future sort of emblazoned across her chest. And she was so excited about the positioning, she just wanted to dress up as the positioning. <laughs>